The Earth. Lecture 5. Um, this lecture on the Earth is a continuation of what I believe are some marvelous insights. Uh, the first one we're going to have is uh, from the book Secrets of the Light by Danian Brinkley. Quote from page 11. We have come to this earth for the express purpose of learning to master the proper execution of our pre-existing spiritual wisdom. We will act as our own judge and jury. Take it from me, this is a far more eye-opening point of view than any religious perspective we might now maintain. And in the end, we alone will hold ourselves accountable for our every thought, word, and deed, as well as the resulting ramification in the lives of those we touch. The eternal journey, I don't think you can read that, but the authors are Craig R. Lundahl and Harold A. Widdison. And again, these are two researchers, uh, professors uh, at the time. One was in Arizona, one was in the state of New Mexico. And as a part of their research, they have a, a unit, I wouldn't call it a chapter, on the future of the earth. Now, we are going to, I promise you, we're going to have probably a couple of hours worth, I'm not sure yet how much to include. But it, it seems like one of the things that happened to our near-death experiencers is... Uh, Oft times they are allowed to see into the future. Uh, at one time I called those previews, and uh, other times I call them future, uh, last days, you know, there's a whole bunch of terminologies. But in, in their uh, book, these two authors are quoting Kenneth Ring. Now that's a name that should ring to all of us that have read much about near-death experiences. And so this is a quote from uh, Kenneth Ring about the earth and the last days. There is, first of all, a sense of having total knowledge but specifically, one is aware of seeing the entirety of the Earth's evolution and history from the beginning to the end of time. The future scenario, however, is usually of short duration, seldom extending much beyond the beginning of the 21st century. The individual reports that in this decade there will be an increasing incidence of earthquakes, volcanic activity, and generally massive ge geophysical changes. There will be resultant disturbances in weather patterns and food supplies. The world economic system will collapse and the possibility of nuclear war or accident is very great. Respondents are not agreed on whether a nuclear catastrophe will occur. 
all of these events are transitional rather than ultimate. However, and they will be followed by a, by a new era in human history, marked by human brotherhood, universal love, and world peace. Though many will die, the earth will live. Um, I think that's all I want to read out of here. Um, it's available. Amazon. As are all the other books except one. Home and Back Again by Imelda Fowler Quoting from page 86 and 87 Why was I allowed to see the devil? Or rather, why was he allowed to visit me directly, face to face? just after I had been with the Savior. In order to understand the answer, we need to discuss another important topic. This is not easy for me to put into words, but I'll try. I understand that the principles of the entire universe and the way it is governed is through universal law. We call these laws absolutes, or truth. They never change, and it is these laws that align the heavens in perfect order. And in the two lectures ago, I read to you from Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verses 43 through 44, 45, where the, the planets, stars, Earths, moons, are fixed by law. But I have also learned that there is a perfect balance to these natural laws. When one pleads to the Lord in prayer, it is required that there will be an equal time or an opposition to that which we are praying for don't understand that. There is an old euphemism that says the devil gets his due. There's more to that simple statement than most people realize. The devil's equal time was designed for this earth life and it is to be used as a test of our character in all that we do in every facet of our lives. It is part of the divine plan of eternal progression that mankind be tested during the earth life, this earth life, to see if our innate natures will harmonize with these eternal laws. The purpose of this opposition is to use our God-given free agency to either do good or evil. Our choices are then weighed against these principles. Because Satan is the great adversary, he is allowed to test us to see if we will live the laws of heaven or follow the carnal laws of the devil. Earth was created for that very purpose, to allow each of us to come down here and test our character to see if we are worthy to return to the presence of God. Part of that test is to prove if we have enough spiritual confidence, trust in the Lord, to pray and expect to receive an answer. We call that process faith. So, 
we've we've read uh, probably a dozen, maybe more. And these people just didn't get together and say, "Okay, now what are we going to what are we going to tell people about the earth as a result of our near-death experiences?" Uh, these are this is not coincidence. It's a confirmation that there is a God and he has a plan and the earth is a part of it. His plan. Okay? Last quote. Oh, sorry. The Journey Home by uh, Philip Berman, another researcher, and, and he spends a bit of his time at the end of his book talking about mysticism, and uh, I, I didn't really even go into that. I, I have no footing in that. Uh, so here's the quote. Because they discover or rediscover God in their lives, most experiencers arrive at the conclusion that they were put here on earth to respect and care for God's creation. Near-death experiencers, experiencer Betty Richards told me this. I've not read a book by her. It makes me sad when human beings are unkind to other creatures who share the earth with us. I always felt a love for animals and nature, but after my near-death experience, I feel even more connected to them, to the cats, to trees, to bushes. That life force, you know. And this connection breeds a higher degree of responsibility for life on earth. It shows me how I must live my life. The Native Americans felt this same level of connection with the life force, and I think we've lost that feeling today. But the near-death experience seems to bring this respect for the earth back to us in a very elemental way. And hopefully from the things that we've read from all the hundreds and thousands of accounts and stories that it, that we can learn from these near-death experiencers and, and move back to God where we need to, if we need to. This attitude is quite reminiscent of the book of Genesis when we are told that Adam's primary responsibility when he entered the Garden of Eden was to tend it. A significant number of near-death experiencers I met take this teaching of the garden quite seriously. So seriously, in fact, that it infuses their lives with a tremendous sense of mission. Many Christian theologians today call this mission stewardship of the earth, which is the task of caring for God's creation, rather than merely exploiting it for self-aggrandizement or personal profit. And I'm just going to let it run here. Oh, I've got to hold up my pink signs. The Earth, Lecture 6, and the last one. Fast Lane to Heaven by Ned Dougherty. <laughs> he, uh, his angel is a lady, and he keeps referring to as the Lady of Light, and I just, I just love that. I just, 
I, it feels comfortable to me. Quote, As my life review ended, I found myself still suspended within the crystalline sphere. Surrounding me in every direction was an incredible vastness of space. Stars and planets in varying degrees of brilliance seemed to stretch into infinity. The universe in which these stars and planets existed was in a realm of indescribable depth. I realized that I was not in the universe as I knew it on earth, but in another celestial realm. I became aware that the universe in which earth is located is only part of a more limitless heavenly realm. Sorry, but I have tendonitis and it hurts. Okay, another quote on page 78. The Lady of Light showed me another scene of Earth suspended in space. I watched as the axis of Earth's rotation began to shift significantly. I could not tell how much time the shift took, nor was I shown a time or date when it would take place. I could tell that sig significant geophysical changes to the Earth's surface would take place as a result of the shifting of Earth's axis. Great earthquakes erupted throughout the world, significantly changing the major continents. There were volcanic eruptions of great magnitude, spewing clouds of billowing smoke and ash throughout the atmosphere, sending the earth into a period of darkness. Great floods resulted from melting and shifting polar ice caps. Many low-lying land areas were engulfed by huge tidal waves. I watched scenes of these events taking place, depicting like black and white movies depicted. I watched one scene from a hilltop location on the coastline of Long Island, New York. I read, I share, you decide. I'm not picking on New Yorkers. This is out of the text. I have a brother and sister-in-law who live in New York. As rows of massive tidal waves descended on the coastline, burying the land under the water, I saw another scene from a street corner in New York City. A wall of water rushed down the wide street as surrounding office buildings began to collapse. In another scene, I watched as a massive wall of water hit the coastline of Miami Beach. In its wake, I watched as an entirely new land mass rose up out of the ocean. And he goes on. Now, I will have, as I've said previously, several discussions, lectures, sharing uh, about the signs of the times, the last days, catastrophes, calamities that come from our near-death experiencers. And I, and I must say, and, and this, is my, this is my last quote on the subject, actually it's two pages long, but these things do not need to happen. We need to get our spiritual vibrations in harmony with the earth, in harmony with God, and in harmony with nature, and in harmony with one another. And these things could be averted. All right. I've got the hiccups, sorry. A flood of questions raced through my mind as I was shown events that I understood were to take place on Earth in the future. During the end times, I was aware of the presence of the Lady of Light, visible to my right, viewing the scenes that were before me. 
I realized that the Lady of Light was also influencing my viewing of the scenes of the end times. As I focused on her, I recognized her place and prominence in the sequence of events that were to take place during the end times. I was aware that the earthly landscape of mountainside and valley was visible beyond the vastness of space that represented the end times. In other words, I was being shown an earthly landscape escape that would exist following the end times. I recognized that the end times did not mean the end of the world. It meant the end of the world as we know it. But it also meant the beginning of a new world. I perceived that the earthly landscape in the distance was part of the new world. But it seemed so far away, barely discernible, almost mystical, like a dream world. The Lady of Light waved her right hand in the direction of the earthly landscape and drew my attention to it. The view appeared to telescope toward me. The mountainside and valley scene was familiar and I again recognized the scene from an actual location on earth. However, I was now viewing this scene at a time that was several decades after the year 2000. This garden setting in which I stood had been transformed during the intervening years by great geophysical changes to the earth. It was now located in a clearing on a field of grass of incredible richness and texture. I was surrounded by trees of pine, birch, spruce, but they were interspersed incongruously with smaller tropical plants and bushes and the trees, plants, and bushes seem to have a life of their own. The roots, trunks, branches, and leaves of the plants and trees had a life force of energy coursing through them. Even the blades of grass seemed to be vibrantly alive. That's the way it is now, too. We just don't recognize it to the depth that he does. All things had energy and life in this place and were all interconnected by some greater design and source of energy. It seemed as if all the plant life was communicating an energy, an energy of life. I absorbed this energy willingly, recognizing that the energy of this place had special healing powers that I wanted to absorb. I felt that I was one with nature and that everything in nature, whether animate or inanimate in appearance, consisted of a universal energy that was meant to be shared. The climate of this location was now warmer than I remember it which encountered for the tropical plants interspersed with the pine, birch, and spruce trees. Furthermore, the sky was now more brilliant and of a different coloring as a result of the preceding earth changes. I recognize that nature was now in harmony with God's plan and that God's influence on earth could be seen and manifested by observing all things in nature. The Lady of Light directed my attention to the mountainside and the valley. I recognized a home I saw in a clearing on the side of the mountain. I then found myself viewing a scene in a second floor bedroom inside the house. This is in the New Earth era. I watched as an elder man was peacefully and serenely preparing to die. His son was standing at the foot of his bed. It was one of those special moments between a father and a son that they would both remember for eternity. 
they were communicating to each other that they had had a wonderful life together, although they had to endure many hardships. But at this moment they shared feelings of love and joy that could only exist between a parent and a child. There was no sadness between them, for the act of dying was no longer viewed with sadness and fear. In this new era of mankind, death, I wonder if that's millennial, death was accepted and recognized for what it truly is. The transitional process between the soul's journey on earth and the spiritual afterlife. It was one of the many changes that separated the new world from the old. It was a brave new world in which the Father and the Son lived, and it assured me that this world has a wonderful future. Well, I again, as always, I appreciate patience, uh, appreciate any feedback you'd wish to make, and you could be, uh, you know, contentious or snide or positive or negative or a uh, dozen other words, and, and I will do my best uh, to respond to those that uh, the Spirit directs for me to respond to. But what a, what a great so concept that the earth and God and man are partners. And uh, well, I'll give you one little, one little insight again from the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, it's in Moses chapter 1 about 30 through 39 where as earths are created and roll through to their end times other earths are created and it's an ongoing continuing process that never stops and we are assured that we can participate in that creation process if we follow God's plan and obey His laws. The earth. We ought to be grateful for... Well, she, she's called a her in, in the various uh, uh, experiencers' uh, commentary, so we ought to be grateful for her. And we ought to do more to have more love and respect for her and for nature. Thanks.